goes, a cousin, a joke down the road. Oh, there we are. Oh, I see. Greg. Okay. Check it out. There's a... <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you too, Hi. Elaine. Elaine, we can't. I mean, uh, Ellen, we can't see your like. There you go. Thanks. Okay, I gotta get a little closer. Well, you know what? Um, yeah. Michael, oh. our leader is there, right? Oops. <laughs> He's a big one. Do this. <clears throat> just so everyone knows the session will be recorded just an FYI yeah. but I'll say it again after we have a couple of minutes Lacey right yeah you got 30 participants 31 now right yeah. that's good yeah you're expecting around 40 do you say you don't know. <laughs> they didn't all sign up. Okay. Oh. Well, people sign up, but they might not necessarily come, or they might watch it later. So yeah, right. hard to tell. Which is good. Yeah, that's great. Elaine, yeah. you look like you're coming to us from the moon. <laughs> oh, I got that when I put my Zoom on first. And with, you know, special effects. That one of them was the moon. <laughs> Oh. Kevin, have you read all those books? <laughs> Funny. <laughs> uh, I'd say probably not. <laughs> A lot of them collect dust. Do you, the question is, do you dust them off? <laughs> that I do. I'm a bit of a neat freak. Mm. <laughs> Good. We got about a minute or so to go, all right? And then we'll introduce you. <clears throat> I'll put a cake in the room. Oh. Stephen Kelly. Hi, Don. How you doing? Don Great, Jack. How are you? Good. Good seeing you. You too. Kevin, Bob, he reminds me of last summer's chapter. <laughs> I hope it's not that bad. No, it's not true. <laughs> it's refreshing. There's women on this one. <laughs> All right. right. <laughs> mm. Mm. Oh, my. Uh, Tom Wilhelm. Art Picaro with the mountains behind him. <laughs> Machu Picchu or something. Coming to you from Machu Picchu. Ooh. Hi, Art. Wow. <clears throat> Oh, right. Machu Picchu. Uh, <laughs> Judith, do you and your husband live in Dunwoody? <laughs> I do. Mm -hmm. Ellen, we went together with um, Ann Murphy right. last week. Yeah. Yep. And yep. Jerry, good friend of mine, good friend of yours, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. How could you not admire her? I don't know where she gets her energy. I really oh, don't. Oh, I don't either. <laughs> yeah, they're a big couple. <laughs> they are. Did you do the CRS webinar yesterday? No, I didn't. I didn't tune in. I didn't either. No, <laughs> I have too much going on here. Right. <laughs> Hi, Joe. I guess we can catch it if we uh, hey. they put it on. Michael Dennis. Florida. What do you think, uh, Lacey? If we should begin. Yes, and just a quick reminder to everybody: the session's being recorded. So just so you all know. All right. And we'll post it later Thank if you want to watch you. it again. <laughs> okay.
Well, let, let me welcome all of you. I'm happy that you're able to be with us. Um, I want to welcome you to our fourth presentation. Jack, your microphone's off. Sorry, I got muted, Father Jack. Now, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Well, welcome to our fourth presentation on Augustine and Catholic social teaching. We began our journey on March 18th, 2020, with Kevin DePrinzio giving us an overview of Augustine and uh, social teaching. On April 22nd, Paul Morrissey and Jeremy Ayers reflected on Augustine and the issues of restorative justice. And in September, we had Michelle Pistone and Art Picaro who reflected on Augustine and the challenge of immigration. And so tonight, uh, we're privileged to have Kevin back and to be joined by Dr. Terry Nance uh, to lead us in a reflection on Augustine and racism, Black Lives Matter. Kevin, as you know, is Villanova's Vice President for Mission and Ministry, and Dr. Terry Nance is Villanova's Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, we are in the process, uh, to remind you now, we're in the process of planning for next year, 2021, and we would like to have your input as to themes and and uh, uh, what we would, how we would uh, uh, address various topics, and also give us some suggestions on presenters. All right, and with that, therefore, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin and Terry, and it's up to you. And thank you. Well, God help us if it's just up to the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> and she will. <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm grateful that at least one of the two of us is Terry Nance. I'm really, uh, I was reflecting earlier, um, the gift uh, that Terry is uh, to me and also to Villanova. I, I have the privilege of ministering with her almost every day. We, we find ourselves in, in Zooms all over the place and we forget what the topic is, but we end up being in the same Zoom room all the time at various meetings. So it's, I'm so happy to be doing um, this work with Terry. Um, so uh, what we're hoping to do is um, I'm going to give some kind of revisit some Augustinian themes and Augustinian approach, and then hand it over to Terry, who's going to then root us more into uh, receiving the work, okay, of, of what our task is tonight. So I begin with 2020 vision. Think about how when we rang in 2020, we did so as we normally do on a New Year's Eve, looking back and looking forward, looking forward in hope with prayers to God that this would be a great year, a new year, something offering us something offering us something new, a new place. But we had no idea what that would be. And perhaps you heard various vision, um, vignettes and quips shared about having a 2020 vision um, on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. And if uh, maybe some of the friars among us, like me, even preached about having a 2020 vision. And then, as one of my students said last semester, as we were preparing to leave um, after spring break for lockdown, which we had no idea what that even meant, one of my students lamented to me and said, geez, you know, it was really all downhill from there. It all started with the tragic death of Kobe Bryant and uh, his companions in that helicopter crash. And then 2020 just kind of kept going downhill from there quickly. And then the rhetoric started changing about 2020 was the worst year yet, that all of these issues were being put on top of each other. Global pandemic, social political unrest, the further exposure of racial injustice with the murder of George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and now Philly's own Walter Wallace. 
let's be honest, this is not the 2020 vision that we had hoped for. This is not the 2020 vision that we thought we would be getting. And admittedly, it is what we see though, however. 2020 is giving us a, a particular vision and is asking of us to look and to pay attention maybe to things that we really don't want to see, things that we've been ignoring. We can hear echoes of Augustine here, his famous Sermon 30, although all the sermons are somewhat famous, where he says, as he was reflecting with his people, bad times, hard times, this is what people keep saying. But let us live well, and times shall be good. For we are the times. Such as we are, such are the times. And you figure that was being said 1,600 years ago, and times maybe haven't really changed, right? So these times that we see, well, Augustine is saying we're seeing something of ourselves in these times, aren't we? And maybe things that we don't want to see and notice about ourselves. And given that our topic tonight that Terry and I are facilitating is Augustine on Catholic social teaching as applied to racism and Black Lives Matter, we have done this with racism. We can easily talk about this, about racism as something outside of us, something outside of me. When maybe Augustine's insight is saying maybe there's something in me in us that we have to pay attention to once and, and, and really claim it and do the work that it's asking of us to do. So my hope now is briefly to lay out or suggest a groundwork for us for an Augustinian way to approach the work of anti-racism, to receive our charge, our task that will be further expressed by what Terry offers in a, in a few moments. So I'm going to be revisiting some of the topics that we did in our first, first section back in March. So here we go. Hopefully you're ready for it. This Friday, November 13th, the Feast of All Saints of the Augustinian Order is the 1666th anniversary of the birth of of Augustine, our spiritual father, born in the city of Tagast, now present-day Sukaras, Algeria, which is located in the northern part of Africa. But in the wake of all that has been revealed in our country, in our world, since the summer, with the further exposure of systemic racism, I wonder if the Augustinian community, the Augustinian family gathered here, if we have an opportunity here presented to us, and that is to be more intentional and more prophetic in claiming or reclaiming Augustine's African heritage. I want to say that again. I wonder if part of the 2020 vision for us as Augustinians, and we're all Augustinian in, in different ways, I wonder if there's an invitation here and a challenge for us to be more intentional and prophetic in how we situate who our spiritual father is as an African. Now, before we start going, patting ourselves on the back about, wow, we get a chance to be prophetic. This is great. Working out our baptism. Awesome. I say this for two reasons, each of which I think is challenging each in its own way. First, we have learned 
from black Catholic scholars like the late Father Cyprian Davis, OSB, a Benedictine, the author of The History of Black Catholics in the United States, Father Brian Massingale of Fordham University, and Villanova's own Dr. Shannon D. Williams, that St. Augustine of Hippo has always, that is, he has always been claimed by the Black Catholic community as both a patron and a sharer in their African heritage. Always. In fact, November, as we know, is Black Catholic History Month. Did you know that one of the reasons why this month was chosen back in 1990 by the National Black Catholic Clergy Caucus to be the month designated for Black Catholic History Month was because of Augustine's birthday. Augustine's birthday was, has always been valued by the Black Catholic community. The other reason is because of St. Martin de Porres, the first Black Catholic saint. Also, Venerable Augustus Tolton, the first Black priest in the United States, and one of the five Black women and men in the U.S. on the road to canonization, was named for Augustine, intentionally by his family, because Augustine is a patron for Black Catholics. Second point. Somehow, it seems that we have downplayed such a claim to his identity, or maybe failed to see the import of doing so, of upholding this African identity. And this is how it goes in our rhetoric. We'll identify Augustine from Tagast, from Hippo, and we'll quickly say, that's North Africa. And then we'll quickly say, part of the Roman Empire. As if to say, well, he's North African, he's not African. This is just simply a pondering that I've been sitting with and I've been reading about. Is there something subtle, unknown to me, unknown to us, that influences the way we situate who Augustine is? Because, yes, he, he was North African, and it is part of the Roman Empire, but oftentimes we then start to eventually talk about the color of his skin. Well, his mother was part of the Berber tribe, so he was a little bit darker. Again, that's sometimes how we talk, as if to say, he's not black, he's North African. So there may be something there that we might need to look at that our black Catholic sisters and brothers don't see, or they do see, right? What I'm suggesting is that it reveals even just a little bit our own blindness and deafness to the lived experience, the cries of our black sisters and brothers within the very body of Christ who are hurting, both within the body, within our country, and within our world. And I think we have to come to terms with that. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. And I have to admit that I'm not even sure what I even mean by that. I just feel like I'm on the... the, the the brink of something, but I don't really know even the depth of what that means for me in my own life as one who follows Augustine. But I know deep down that there is a challenge there. And I hope and pray with my brothers and sisters in Augustine that we can start to do a little bit of that work. In other words, we have to own this moment if we really are our our times, as our Holy Father says that we are, and what this moment might mean for us, how we are formed, 
as Augustinians, as members of the body of Christ, and our emerging, deepening identity of that membership and our call during these times in the 21st century. In other words, could how we respond in this moment to and engage the hard work of anti-racism and racial justice be the very thing that God is calling the Augustinian family to now answer in the 21st century. What the church, which includes black lives, is calling us to be about. As Terry will reveal in a few moments, much more deeply, this invitation is no easy task and it's going to take perseverance, consistency, accountability, commitment, and continued acknowledgement of our failings as we try to pick up and keep working at it. And now what I'd like to offer is a few points of reflection rooted in the rule and charism of the Augustine way of life that's going to help us revisit a little bit about what we opened up with in the middle of March. And then I'll hand it over to Terry. I know I keep anticipating, Terry, that I'm going to be handing it over to you, but not just yet. First, the opening lines of the rule of Augustine. Friars know them by heart. It charges the community to live together harmoniously, in union. One in mind and heart, the Latin is in deum, translated two different ways as on the way to God or intent upon God. There's a sense here in our charge of a sense of journey that's being laid out, that there's an action involved, shared and held in common, with a clear end, but also an admission of not yet, an intention and a sense of being on the way. It captures a little bit of the famous or infamous Augustine restlessness. Could we see that what has been revealed in the further exposure of racial injustice, of systemic racism, not just individual racism, in the country and in the church, could we see this as an opportunity to deepen our call and charism to harmonious living, a living out of true unity within diversity, of a true mutual sharing of goods that everybody has because of our inherent worth and dignity made in the image and likeness of God, that Augustine says is the stuff, the very stuff of our shared journey toward and search for God, the double commandment of love of God and neighbor. Now recall again from our first uh, segment in mid-March, the development for Augustine of this oneness of mind and heart. Scholars have shown that when he first started tackling what, what oneness of mind and heart meant, he was looking at the individual person's heart, his own heart, and this sense of integration and wholeness within the person. But then after some dialogue with some people in his life, most notably um, Paulinus and Theresia of Nola, husband and wife, um, he came to a deeper sense of this corporate nature of oneness, a oneness of mind and heart of a community of a, a corporate person, the body of Christ. So we can look at it both as an individual and also as a whole body, a whole community, us gathered here, for instance, a church, a country. Doing the work of anti-racism is the work toward oneness within each one of us as individuals, but also as a community. So there's a twofold understanding, right? And it involves a movement, a dynamic, a back and forth between the individual and the community and how they mutually inform and form each other, back and forth, challenging each other, back and forth. At the same time, it speaks of a tension held between disintegration and integration, 
fragmentation and wholeness, blindness and blind spots, and a true 2020 vision, both within the individual person and within the corporate communal person. You might hear some of St. Paul here with the body of Christ as well. Let's add a further dimension from Augustine, his understanding of interiority, the inner life and inner work, not only of the individual, but also as it relates to the inner life and inner work of the community, that corporate body, the corporate person. Remember, Augustine doesn't just speak of the individual person's heart being restless. The actual line that he uses in the confession is it's the corporate shared heart that is restless. He, the proper translation is, our heart is restless until it rests in God, not our hearts are restless. There's a great, deep, challenging insight with that and how that can apply to our work that's before us with anti-racism. So when we talk of anti-racism and issues around racial injustice, it's not simply admitting that the individual person has work to do so as to bring about a conversion or a transformation of that individual person's heart. It's also admitting that the work is of the whole community, that the whole community together has to do this work of conversion and transformation of the corporate heart, which just touches upon the reality of structures and systems that perpetuate racism, that perpetuate white supremacy, that perpetuate white privilege. Lastly, Augustine's great challenge that we friars are so good at avoiding fraternal correction. In other words, how we hold each other accountable to our work, right? Can we do so with love for each other and for the sake of the whole? Challenge each other on this stuff. Do so in a loving way, but also in a way that's that's not going to let us off the hook either, right? And say, hey, that statement, I'm, I'm really bothered by what you may have just said there. And I'm not sure what I'm hearing when you say this, this is what I'm hearing. And I, I, I think there might be something here in terms of racism that you may not see. And, and of course, when we open the door to that, we're opening the door for that challenge from our own brothers and sisters to call us out on that task. So I think that's enough for now in terms of an Augustinian way of approaching this. Um, I'll hand this over to Terry and uh, we'll see where it takes us. Thank you so much. I am uh, so moved by what you just said and I can't tell you how much I want to ditch what I have put together and begin to talk to you exactly what's going on when we can't accept the African that is in us. What's going on when we want to make, ex when we want to uh, count the uh, amount of color in skin so we can determine who's really legitimate or not. But I can't. I'll get there if we get, because I've prepared this, I got a great slide deck, and we're going to go through it. So, hmm. with that, <clears throat> racism is the unconfessed, unredeemed, original sin of the United States. Is that a startling statement to you? Well, to some perhaps, but in some ways, not surprised. The history we were taught in school sanitized and only vaguely presented the details of the enslavement of four million people. So much so that most Americans have no idea how or why the system of chattel slavery developed in this country. And more important for our work here today, 
understand how the legacy of this slavery still impacts the lives. I, I had written still impacts the lives of black Americans. But Kevin, after listening to you, I'm going to say still impacts the lives of all of us today. Right? Our corporate hearts. Now, if you're not startled by this, I'd say good. That means you've done a little bit of reading. And I would say as much as you've done, there is so much more to know. Uh, it is with great excitement that I can tell you that the, the publications that are coming out now, the, the uh, conferences of people re-exploring uh, this whole period of our history is just so tremendous. And so continue thinking and learning. But um, again, a good teacher, best way to start this conversation with some definitions. And I'm going to draw my definitions today from Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, you'll note I didn't put on your reading list because I didn't think you could finish the book in the time, but if you haven't read it, you really need to. And I particularly like his definition of, uh, of anti-racism. And uh, I'm going to show it to you right now because I think it just makes the point so well. Uh, here we go. Beginning. He says, if you look at this, and let's take this apart. Racism is the marriage of racist policies and racist ideas that produces and normalizes racial inequities. Now, let's break those, let's, let's break those down a little bit. Now, racial inequities is when two or more racial groups are not standing on approximately equal ground. And we can talk about the nature of that ground, but they're not standing on equal ground. And then what's interesting is that connection to a racist policy. And a racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains this racial inequality. So when Kevin was talking about um, uh, systems, right? That's where the, the policies get instantiated, right? And what's interesting is that these policies can be written or unwritten. And I'm going to tell you some stories later where how, how strong these unwritten policies are. And, but the bottom line is that these policies provide guidelines that govern people's lives. And then next, let's talk about what a racist idea is. And a racist idea is any idea that suggests that one group is inferior or superior to another group. And what's interesting is that racial ideas then argue that these inferiorities or superiorities of racial groups explain the social inequities in our country or uh, among people, All right? So let's get rid of this. I am not with the new technology. I want to see people. There you go. So, um, so let's get back to that definition. I would ask you to repeat it back to me, but this isn't a class. So the, the, the marriage between policy and ideas that produce inequities that appear normal, right? That appear normal. So let's, let's think about what we take for normal in our lives. It is normal that black men are two and a half times more likely than white men to be killed by police in this country. It is normal in America for the majority of black children to attend underfunded schools that are also structurally unsafe. It is normal in this country for black neighborhoods to be dumping grounds for industrial waste. It is normal in this country according to the Harvard uh, Medical Journal, that maternal mortality of black women is so much higher than white women, and that the mortality of black babies is the highest of any racial group in the country. And it is normal in this country for the net worth of white Americans to be 10 times the net worth of black Americans. 
Now, clearly, the way that I'm saying this is clearly telling you that I think that this is important. And yet, I would ask you, did one of those statistics surprise you? We hear them and we go, oh, where's the outrage? Where's the, the disbelief? It's, we say, that's the way things are. And what's my point? Racism has marked so much of America's history that it manifests itself in most every aspect of life in this country and appearing so normal that it shields the fact that often the achievements and progress of some people comes at the cost and perhaps even the survival of others. I wish I were exaggerating, but I'm not. Now, to cover this enormous topic in the very short time that we have and still have time for reflection, um, I'm going to do a couple of things. I want to talk a little bit about history. I want to talk about slavery. I want to talk about post-Reconstruction, which really is probably very important to what we're experiencing to get today. And then I want to talk about modern racism, but I want to tell you some stories as we talk about modern racism. So let's begin with some historical reflections. And I'm actually going to begin with a more contemporary concept that some of you may have heard. But I remember when I told my then 85-year-old father this, he couldn't believe it. I said, Dad, race is a social construction. Now, this is a man who was born in 1923 and had lived in America all that time and suffered the indignities. And he looked at me and he said, now that's hard to believe. But then I showed him that according to uh, the National Association of Genesis, uh, Gen Geneticists in America, that there, that there is, that when we look at individual people, that we have more that unites us than divides us. And what they concluded is that race is more of a social and political topic, uh, differentiator, than it is a biological one. And so you might say, well, how, well why is that? And actually, we can go all the way back to 1684, leap forward to the mid-1700s, and even go to the 1800s. And what we have is we have people who are, as they talk about human beings, needing to, and, and to understand human beings, needing to put them into groups. And they need to put them into racial groups. But what I want to talk about is the fact that one of these people in particular um, decided that these groups were on a hierarchy, and he was Johann Blumenbach. And what Blumenbach does, and I know I'm going through this, just take this as a story. I'm just telling you a story. So there's this guy, Blumenbach. He's doing the research. He's read Bernier. He's read other people. And he's trying to say, okay, I want to figure out how I can do that, what I can add to the science. And he determines that the most beautiful people in the world live at the base of the Caucasus Mountains. Caucasus Mountains, are you getting it? And from there, he determined that that the worth of the various races was the degree of variation they were from these most beautiful people of the Caucasus Mountain area. So who ends up on the bottom? The Africans. So as this country was being founded, it's particularly uh, noteworthy that the intelligent people right, knew this new science of race and in fact called themselves race men, right? So this new science, this new way of understanding is giving us the scientific evidence right, of the inferiority of Africans. But there were people even before that who had established the inferiority of Africans because another theory that was very much um, in vogue was the theory of polygenesis, right? That Africans existed on this strata between humans and apes. And right now we think, how ridiculous is that? Who would have ever thought? Who would have ever taken that seriously? If you read Thomas Jefferson's book, Notes on the State of Virginia, he talks about the African woman's affinity for the orangutan. Now, he doesn't firmly 
put himself in the camp of polygenesis, but he still asserts the natural, right, natural, normal inferiority of Africans because of environment and culture and go so far to assert that because of their environment, because of the, the, uh, the climate, they never could, that the African cultures, that first of all, Af even when I say African, it makes me crazy. They were actually talking about West African nations, right? They weren't Africans, Africa's a whole continent, but that Africans had never produced anything of merit or worth, that there was nothing, no remnants of culture on the entire continent. Of course, our research shows that there are great empires right, in Africa by the Africans. But again, I'm not going to go through that right now. So, and, and if you think about it, there was a convenience, right, in believing that Africans were subhumans. Why? We were a new nation. New nations not only need freedom, they need money. And so, and what better way to get your economic footing than to establish industries that require a lot of labor and you don't pay for the labor? It is just, in some ways, that simple. I know when I teach my African-American rhetoric course, which you don't get a chance to do a lot these days, but when I teach my African-American rhetoric course, I often tell my students, you know, it wasn't personal. This is just business, right? <laughs> I am not diminishing the cruelty. I am not diminishing the humanity, but it was a sound business decision. Because the interesting thing is the system of slavery that we established. I am sure we have many Roman scholars here who could talk about, this, about the system of slavery that existed in the Roman empires. Well, chattel slavery is different because the enslaved person is owned forever. And their children are owned forever. And the American system even adds an extra twist to what the uh, English were doing. Instead of slavery being based on the father, it was based on the mother. Now, at this point uh, in my classes, I sit back and I say, why do you think that's true? We can't do that on Zoom, so I'll tell you. Think about it. Your stock of slaves is getting low. It's going to be a little while until the international ship comes through. How do you increase your herd? You rape black women and their children become your property. As I say these words now, you probably hear the disgust in my voice. I can't even say it in a neutral term. It was just normal. It was the way things are. What's the definition of racism, right? Policy, a racist policy, a racist idea that creates a racial, that creates a system of inequality. As I go through this presentation, what I want you to understand is that these practices that we're talking about were not conceived of by monsters. They were men who were trying to advance on their own goals. No justification here. Just trying to put this as they were people who were making decisions and feeling justified because of what I said before, the Africans weren't fully human. Before, I don't want to take too much more time because I'm getting carried away with myself. I do want to talk about the fact that slavery actually appears in the Constitution in three places. Everybody probably remembers the three-fifths clause. As you know, when we were trying to determine um, the, the, how, what representation would look like, it was decided that every state would have two representatives going to the Senate and that in the House, it would be based on the number of, of citizens, right? The number of people. However, <laughs> the Southern states knew that if they only counted the citizens, the ones who voted, they wouldn't have many people. So they wanted, and this is the irony, 
they wanted to count black bodies then. Didn't quite, the northerners weren't accepting that. So the compromise was that three fifths of the enslaved population could be counted for the, for the purposes of determining representation. In that way, black lives didn't really matter. It was rather uh, their, their bodies for representation mattered. Then of course there was the compromise that uh, there were many people who wanted to abolish slavery right from the beginning, but, con but there were those who fought against it. So there was a compromise in order to get the constitution through. So for 20 years, the um, uh, uh, slave trade, was, the international slave trade continued and it wasn't abolished until 1808. Um, and the Third area where um, slavery appears in the Constitution is, of course, the Fugitive Slave Act. And you know what that does is that it says, even if an enslaved person travels to a free state and becomes, you know, runs away and becomes free, that that, that that enslaved person has no rights and must be returned to the owner because that's not a person. That's property. Black lives don't matter. Property matters. So slavery becomes so important to the United States because slavery really begins the US journey to becoming an economic power. The bodies of enslaved people served as America's largest financial asset. And they were forced to maintain at that time America's most exported commodity. Do you know what that is? King cotton. And so in 60 years, between 1801 and 1862, the cotton picked daily by an, uh, an enslaved person increased 400%. Now, the, the uh, Eli Whitney's um, cotton gin had something to do with that, but the profits from cotton propelled the United States into its strong economic position in the world at that time. And the ownership of enslaved people created uh, the greatest amount of wealth for individuals in that Mississippi Valley area in, in terms of the entire country. Now, while all this is going on, of course, there's resistance to slavery. The abolition movement begins to really grow from 1830 to 1860s. I'm gonna skip over now. So we have the war, war is ended, and then we hear about Reconstruction. Now, I don't know about you, but I definitely remember hearing about Reconstruction. Do you remember the term carpetbaggers? Some of you, do you remember that term? And actually carpetbaggers were, print, were portrayed in very negative ways because they were coming down to the South and taking advantage of the, of the poor defeated Southerners. Well, what we find out, my, my good friend, a former, uh, history professor Larry Little explained to me that actually had to do with who wrote the textbooks that we all studied from. And they were not, they were uh, from, they were from Texas, or they were selling books to Texas, but they wrote it from a Southern point of view. The carpetbaggers were really volunteers. Probably like some of you, they were volunteers who went down to the South to help the newly emancipated people. And what they did is that they started schools, the open daycares, uh, they were teaching women um, how, to, uh, how to run farms. Uh, they, they talked about setting up government. At that point, we had uh, senators sent to Washington who were black, lo local governments that were almost all black and councils, but that all came to an end. And it came to an end at a presidential election that was contested, who could figure? And that was in 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden. And, what, and before it could go to the Electoral College, Hayes contacted Tilden and said, if you let me win, I will withdraw the, the federal troops from the South. Tilden agreed and in 1877, Reconstruction ended. And when Reconstruction ended, race relations and life for black Americans, at that point they were Americans, went back to the time of the antebellum slide. So slave codes became black codes, black codes became Jim Crow. 
between the years of 1865 and 1877, that was before the end of Reconstruction, 2,000 Black Americans were lynched. In the time from Reconstruction to 74 years later, according to Brian Stevenson, 4,400 men, women, and children were lynched in this country. Now, I want you to understand, we say the word lynch, we go, oh my, and we have these, these images from TV or um, or movies where we cut away from the really bad part. But I want you to think about what lynching is. Essentially, it is we go from accusation to execution. Right? And so what you could be found guilty of, disrespecting a white person, uh, the accusation of... Um, of paying too much attention to a white woman. It could have even been that you had more money than people thought you should have. And for that, you paid for your life. And if you were a wife who protested against your husband being lynched, then you were lynched as well. And as hideous as lynching was, Douglas Blackman in his book, Slavery by Another Name, tells the story that from Reconstruction until the beginning of World War II, Blacks were literally re-enslaved in the South. Remember those, Jim, those uh, Black Codes Jim Crow laws that I was talking about? Not stepping off the sidewalk, not tipping your hat, uh, not being duly supplicant to a white person could get you thrown into the county jail. Once there, you could be and a group were there, then you could be sold to corporations or to mines. And you would then have the opportunity to work off your fine. But of course, your fine had accrued interest. And then once you paid that off, then you had to pay for your room and board. What's the point? Often, many of these folks died in process. They were thrown in unmarked graves. And even more sad were the ones who couldn't work any longer and they were just abandoned and put out of the work camps. Black lives, black human beings didn't matter. So as we go to the, and so what I hope I have done so far is at least giving you sort of the, the legal, if you will, framework, um, whoops, I can't find my, oh, here it is, um, for what was going on in this country and why. So what I want to do quickly right now is just tell you some short stories because one of the things I hope that I'm able to, to share with you clearly, if I can get this going, is that racism we talk about racism is systemic, structural, and racism is personal, right? Those systems impact personal lives. So I'm gonna tell you some stories of my family. So you're gonna meet a couple generations of my family. So first, first, this is my mom, my granddad, my grandmom, and my uncle. Now, Mac Duffy Anderson is my granddad. He's an amazing man. I'm actually a third-generation college student because my grandfather, born just after the Civil War, was able to attend Alcorn State College. He was the pride of the family. You can see the, the adoration there. It was just so incredible. My grandfather was also an avid hunter. And uh, he, one day, as the story goes, he had gone out with some friends hunting and had evidently eat some, eaten something that was not good and became very ill, and they took him to the hospital. And, of course, this was in Memphis, Tennessee, so he went to the black hospital. And at that time, right, probably 1935, there was this new wonder drug, penicillin. But it wasn't at the black hospital. It was only at the white hospital. And so my grandmother 
Marcel worked for, in my family, we said the white lady, had worked for the white lady and she was cook and, and, and chauffeur. And she knew that she had connections. And so when, when grandfather was laying in the hospital so near to death, grandmother went to the woman she worked for and begged her to use her influence just to allow that, that even if the doctors couldn't come over to the hospital or my, he she couldn't get my grandfather into the hospital, they could just send the pen, penicillin to, send, to save his life. They said no. And you know what the answer was? Because that's just not the way things are done here. Now, when I told this story to a friend of mine who is Caribbean, he said, and how, did your, how did your grandmother get back at her? What did she say? How did she deal with this? I said, she buried my grandfather and went back to work because it was what happened. It was normal. It was maintaining the system of segregation that existed in the South at that time. Now, all life is not tragic. This is my mother, isn't she beautiful? Now, I have this in here because I want you to know the name of her high school. And I was thinking in the presentation we heard before, Kevin said, African American community love St. Augustine. So my mother graduated Actually, I put, her graduation was actually 1944. Oops, that was a mistake. She graduated from St. Augustine High School um, in 1944. And this was um, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And she uh, went to Clark College in Dubuque, Iowa. And there she is. This is her graduation picture. Um, and uh, I put this up there just because I am very proud of my mom. Um, she was 16 when she went away to college. She graduated and she just turned 20. And as you can see, she has a very distinguished list of uh, accomplishments there. And up in this, she wanted to be a social worker. She was going to come back to Cleveland and um, apply her trade. When she went to apply for a job, they told her that there were no caseworkers who were black. But because she had a college diploma, she could become a secretary. A system. A hiring system. It was not personal, but that's the way that racism works. It just becomes the way things are. So, dad and mom get married. This is 1949. And uh, they give us, they, they, here, here we come. Now, this is us, obviously, in our college years. The hair has come down a little bit, but just still get the, get the sense. A lot of hair. But um, I give you this picture because I couldn't find the picture of this younger. But I wanted to tell this story because it becomes important. So imagine these, this family, and this is, and it could roll the date back to 1959. And we are going to go cross country to visit my mother's brother, who you saw in the first picture, because he lived in California now. And my mother, terribly organized woman, gets the triptychs, the AAA triptychs together. And we are excited. We're all in the, in the station wagon and we drive to St. Louis. We get to, we pull in the first night. My mom's got the reservation. She goes up to the desk and the woman looks at her with all of us clustered around her. And she goes, oh, honey. Oh, honey. Y'all just don't know. You can't stay here. Y'all are supposed to stay on the other side of town. Clearly, this was 1959. It was before the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So we went to the other side of town. And I remember very clearly my father staying up all night. And of course, now I realize he was staying up because it wasn't a very safe area and it wasn't a very clean place. And again, it was just at that time, the law of the land. Now, we got my parents, very clever, very clever people. As we were continuing our turn, journey and on the way back, as you can tell, my mom is biracial. My, interesting, both of her parents were biracial. So, um, very fair. And as you can see, 
as the children divide, we are along the color spectrum. So what would happen is that my father, my brother and I would hide in the car while my mother went up and checked us into a hotel. Now, let's now begin to think about racism, not just as the external policies, but as what that says to the children who have to hide who they are just so that the family can get what they need. Racism is as personal as it is structural. That's me. That was my first Villanova picture. Thought I'd throw that in there. And also, of course, um, it was right around this time that the funny story happened to me. My colleagues at the time thought it was hysterical. Uh, my office was in St. Mary's. You know how St. Mary's used to have all the classrooms there? And um, the, speech, the speech department was right on one side of the hall, and the classroom was right on the other. And I had my textbooks in my arm, and I'm getting ready to go in my class. And I see this woman walking down the, down the hall. It must have been the beginning of the semester. And so, you know, always trying to be cheerful, I say, hi, welcome to Villanova. Can I help you? At which point the woman kind of looks around me and says, are you finished in here? And I said, oh, no, I'm just going in. And she says, well, when you finish, can you come up to my son's room because the blinds are broken? So here I am, new PhD, full of myself. Trust me, a little obnoxious. And in just that moment, I was reminded that no matter how many degrees I had, no matter my academic appointment, that my black life doesn't matter. Going on, these are my babies. Aren't they beautiful? So, um, Christian and Jesse. So, uh, Jesse in this, uh, Jesse's got the glasses, and that's Christian. When I could control, I gave you these two pictures so you can see that I could control Christian's hair while he was in high school. When he went to college, all bets were off. And uh, I give you this picture as my last example, because um, uh, what would happen is that Christian would um, uh, sometimes ask, he went to school, uh, he was, went to college at the at, uh, University of Pennsylvania, he would sometimes ask to borrow my car. Now, I will say that my car at the time was a very large Volvo. It's not a comment on the kind of car that we thought was extravagant, it's just a comment on, it's my husband's comment on my driving. I'm not gonna go into any further details, but it wasn't necessary, but it was a very big black car. And I have his picture there. Isn't he an adorable kid? Nice boy. Here's a mama moment, near perfect um, standardized test scores. Finished the five year master, uh, BS MS program in engineering in four years. Very proud of this kid and yet, Every time he had the car and he drove to pick me up, he was stopped by the Radnor police. Sometimes he was pulled out of the car. And one of the things I knew I had to teach my boys who lived in Swarthmore, went to independent schools, wound up going to colleges, I had to keep reminding them that they were black boys. I had to keep telling them Keep your hands on the wheel, move slowly, be respectful, call me as soon as you can. Because despite his mother's love, his near perfect SAT scores, his life didn't matter. So in conclusion, I thought I would end with a quotation, Maya Angelou, who said, history, despite its retching pain, cannot be lived, unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Thank you. Kevin, 
Terry, are, would you want to um, take some questions or from various people? Just have whoever would like to have a question or a reflection, just speak up. Go ahead, Paul. You did. I just thank you so much, both of you. Incredible, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I, the thing that struck me most, uh, in some ways, is Kevin helping us grasp the difference between saying Augustine's African or whether he's North African, and having to explain that. It's just really fascinating and a great, wonderful challenge for us at this. Uh, juncture of our country's history. And uh, it, it excites me. It's like, wow, where can we go from that? I mean, just begin educating our families. My family just said the other day to me, I didn't know Augustine was African. <laughs> I don't think I said, no, he was North African. But anyway, it's just people don't even know that. Maybe we don't even. So it's just so great. And all the images we have of Augustine, most of them are like, you know, he's kind of a white guy or he's clothes and all these clerical clothes he never wore anyway, these big miters and all. So this demythologizing of Augustine and claiming uh, his and maybe you could say our African heritage is very exciting. I thank you so much. Um, hi, this is Marianne McCarthy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I'd like to thank both of you very much for your insight um, and education. Um, I also have a question um, as to, it, it struck a, a hard note on me that your boys were stopped um, because clearly that's wrong. Would you have at the time, because they're now older, address the Radnor police with that issue? Go directly to the source and say did you think to do that or that's such an interesting statement such an interesting question um, what's interesting is that my work at the time had had it had gotten me involved with um, working with uh, students who had been stopped and I knew the and in some ways um, I didn't go on behalf of my sons because I'd already been there I'd already been through that and quite frankly, to go through that humiliation again was not worth it. Mm. That's Marianne, this is Father Peter. Hi, Father Peter. We are still going through that. I know we are. And there is we, a... Uh, I, I just recently had a, uh, one of our black students who was running, doing, jogging through the neighborhood and was stopped by the Radnor police, asked who he was, asked for identification. He said, I'm a Villanova student. I don't have any identification on me. I'm jogging. Wow. said get in the car and they drove him back to Villanova to find out whether he was really a student or not yeah. that was just a few weeks ago wow and, and, and in full disclosure to the group I retired after 38 years of teaching in the Radnor School District and was quite the advocate for this whole situation and learned later in my career probably I started in 74 uh, that there was a, an expression driving while black, DWB in Radnor. And mm. that was just appalling to me. So the pain, and if it is, as Father Peter says, and I believe is still going on, then do we start one person at a time and go in there and have conversations so that we can have this community of heart, uh, not just the individual, but open some eyes. I, I, I just can't see that we can't do something more. I think okay. in some like ways, uh, Mary, and this is Father Peter again, um, because I can see your name, but I can't see you, so. <laughs> I don't have a picture. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. All. You know, I, I think sometimes, you know, when I questioned the officer about bringing this student back, he was like, I, I'm sorry I had to do this, but I got a call from people on the street. 
He said, this black man is running down our street and he doesn't belong here. So it, it goes beyond Radnor police. Hmm. Yes, it does. It goes beyond, you know, it goes into the very fabric of the community that we live in here. Um, there's a, uh, you know, when, when all of the George Floyd episodes started, and, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to get into the, the racism in the main line, but um, yeah. <laughs> when the George Floyd episode took place, you know, Terry, um, I, I always say that Terry taught me and she always, um, you know, cringes just like she is right now <laughs> um, because I, w- I was a student when Terry was a faculty member here. But, um, you know, over the years, Terry has taught me a lot. And, uh, you know, that's why that's why she's in the position she's in today. But, um, you know, we had a lot of conversations at the university about Black Lives Matter, about, uh, you know, the, a dialogue with people. And, and one of the faculty members here at the university told a story of going into a, a jewelry store on, in Wayne and uh, to shop for a, a, a gift for his wife. And he walked in the store and the security guard at the store came up to him and said, can we help you? And he said, I'm looking for, I'm just looking around and stood up at the counter and said, uh, started looking through various items in the counter and salesperson and came up to him and said, can I help you? And he said, I'm looking for a birthday present for my wife. And the saleswoman said to him, sir, you know, this is a very expensive store. I'm not sure this is the kind of store you want to be in. Now, this was in Wayne. This <laughs> Father oh, Peter? Father Peter? Oh, but it's Carol. Carol it's Marianne. Hi there. Hi. So 12 months ago, we walked into the Audi dealership to buy a car. It was a beautiful, sunny On the summer top. day. On the left. There were no customers oh. there. Third down. There were five salespeople there. No one would wait on us. No one would acknowledge us until we started walking out the door and say goodbye to us. And every single time we drove from his mother's home in Philadelphia, when we were young, in our teenage years, we were afraid. We were afraid to being pulled over by the Lower Merriam police. It's not just Radner. But this was every day. But my comment is this. When Black Lives Matter happened, we've been a member of this par- parish for over almost 40 years. Two people, only two, spoke to us and asked us anything. Two out of the thousands we literally know. Mm. Two asked, what can I do? So I implore you, you know, uh, white privilege is here all the time. I know it, I live it. And I have an invested interest in my life for the rest of my life to change my biases. Mm. But I implore you to invite yourself to speak with people of color. Leroy, you, if you're a parishioner, you know my husband. No one said anything. Mm. No one asked a question of us. No one asked to know more. Mm. And my heart sank when a black friend said, Carol, is anyone asking you anything? Is anyone wishing to speak with you? And I said, I know, no one, we're approachable. (laughs) And she said, me either. Why won't white people talk to me? So it's not going to get better unless you engage. And to understand that every day a black person pays the ticket from the moment they wake till the moment they sleep, because you're not looking for the thing to happen, but we could give you hundreds I've been part of it. Hundreds, hundreds of things. You don't wait, you don't look for it, but it happens to you every day of your life, every single day of your life. White people, we get to opt out whenever we want, anytime we want. We get, it's our problem. 
My activist daughter in New York City scares the heck out of me because she's out there all the time. Well, if she gets arrested, it's not the same way as a white person gets arrested. She said, Mom, this is your deal. You have to do something. You have to do it. White people have to do it. Yep. So I'm asking you from the bottom of my heart and you don't have to do anything for me but you have to engage you have to get to know people on a different level and see the stories and terry's story every story she said i heard i i watched i've been with him i've married almost 40 years dated him for seven you know darn it i've been seeing it every day but if you're not opening your eyes and asking questions you're missing out and you're not going to be able to change those biases within you and change your heart if you don't understand it well enough. They're, they're uncomfortable conversations, but they're conversations that need to be. Husband Leroy. That, that, that need to yes. happen. Yes. You know, can I say, can I say something? Uncomfortable conversation, nothing's going to change. I mean, you can sit there and, and think about it and agree with everything, but the uncomfortable conversation has to be, has to happen. Often. Um, Mary, did you want to, I see Mary's yeah. iPad. Thank you. I, I just, I just want to say this, that um, I spent most of my life and I'm pretty up there. Um, and I was surrounded by white people, white colleagues. And it wasn't until I went to the public school system in Philadelphia and discovered all these wonderful colleagues who were darker skinned. And I got to know their, them, themselves. We sat around at lunch and talked. And, we, and the, of course, all the kids were African-American. But you, you, it was the end of my segregation life. I got mixed in. And in the course of that wonderful getting mixed in, I got to know people as people. Now, I was still the white. I was, they were still surprised that I could dance well and stuff like that. But <laughs> we got to know each other. And I would have bet that if you live in Wayne, where my brother also lives, you live a very segregated life. And you never get a chance to just have ordinary conversations, let alone become friends. And it's not until we actually get into relationships with people who look different than us, that we will get to know what they are going through. So the Terry, what I want to tell you was your stories were the most moving part of the whole talk, because until you get to know people as people and what it's really like in their lives, you don't know. You just don't know. Thank you. Absolutely. We do have a question in the chat. Um, if I could throw that out, um, Justin and Eileen uh, ask what, do we think are some of the most effective ways to challenge false narratives of bootstrap meritocracy that are so deep, deeply seated in white privileged communities? Um, I will take a first crack at it and then I would really welcome other folks to, to join in. Um, one of the things, and I, will, I, I am a teacher, my whole life has been spent at Villanova. God. 42 years. Oh. Um, anyway, let's not go there. Um, but I can tell you that there are so many times, uh, I will talk about students, you know, people who said, why don't these students just, you know, you know, get themselves together and, 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 you know, do their work instead of complaining all the time. And what I was able to, to show them is that these students took advantage of everything that their yeah. inner city schools had to give them. And they excelled. And when they got to Villanova, they simply were not on the same academic level as anybody else. Yep. But when we gave them the resources, now here's where the institution comes in, right? When mm -hmm. we gave them the resources, when we had the programs, I will tell you that there are times, not all the time, one of our programs some of you may know at the Academic Advancement Program, our graduation rate is higher than the Villanova graduation rate. So these kids can do it. And so I think when, that, that the point is, is that we have to get people to understand something more than their Wayne neighborhood, as Mary said. And when you think about, like, what drives me crazy is when people talk about welfare queens. And, and I know that there are various... Um, 
uh, projects, I don't know if you've any, I know we have a lot of teachers on the call, where you actually, you can do it as a computer program and you get the amount that you would get in terms of EBT and we say, live on it, right? And we find that the students go, how, how, how do you do this? How is this possible? And then we show films of, of women um, who live and work in the inner city and all that they have to do in order to survive. So basically, um, to me, and I don't want to be harsh, but that's a, people who say that are deeply rooted in their own ignorance. And what you have to do is read something, talk to some people, and then you will understand that that is such, that's not just a false statement, it's a harmful statement. And that's, I think, one of the things that I've been hearing today is that you have to understand that there is nobody innocent in this game, in, mm -hmm. this, in this racism, mm -hmm. right? That we all have been washed in racism. If we're born and raised in this country, we are washed in racist ideas. Mm -hmm. We are washed in what is, what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, what is success and what is not success. And one of the hardest things that we have to do is to challenge some of the ideas that are so deeply rooted in us and recognize that they really come from a place of maintaining one group's superiority at the cost of another's survival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Terry would uh, resonate with this because we've both gotten the emails, but uh, th there are people that have written to both of us in terms of the Villanova reading uh, that goes on that uh, White Fragility, which is a, a book written, if you haven't read it, is a book written by a white person about white attitudes. And, uh, the book that Terry mentioned earlier uh, anti-bias or anti-racism. Anti-racism. Um, anti um, I'm an anti-racist. That it is, it is um, uh, sinful, sinful for a Catholic university to be having students read these books. Um, oh my God. They are totally, you know, looking at a, a, a structure that is not real, that is made up, that is being promulgated by liberals uh, and both of us have, <laughs> have received numerous emails from people about um, us having students read these two, two, mm -hmm. two wow. just those two books. Uh, so, you know, there, there's this attitude. And if you say to, if you say to some of these people, well, you know, that's a racist attitude, they'll say, I'm not a racist. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm not racist at all. I, I can't help but thinking before, I, I don't know how much longer this is going to go, but Kevin, when you were talking, I couldn't help but thinking when you said um, Martin de Porres was the first black saint. And uh, maybe we should be saying St. Augustine was the first black saint. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. Just yeah. one quick comment on your, your, the Caucasus Mountain thing was really incredible. You know, the best looking people live at the base of the Caucasian mountains. Wow, that is really an incredible thing to think about. <laughs> if I could just say, um, thank you both so much. And Terry, that was just amazing. Uh, as an educator, I now um, oftentimes tell people, to your point, Father Peter, that, you know, black history is American history and therefore anti racism is black history is american history you know like it has to be taught in that way it's mm -hmm. all included together there's no dismembering it and unlayering it mm -hmm. it's one that's right and elise uh to to add to that shannon d williams i really encourage you to if you haven't read any of her stuff she's a our professor in uh, our history department and she takes it to another level and says, um, black history is Catholic history. Wow. <coughs> because so often 
it's in the minds and hearts of many Catholics or white Catholics that the black Catholics that are among us are converts when she says they've actually been here longer than we have <laughs> as Catholics. Right. And I she would, traces a whole thing. If you could, Father Kevin, maybe in the future we could do an entire uh, history of black you sure. know, Catholic churches, yeah. and especially in Philadelphia, there's such a rich history, and and really the history of Catholic schools in how um, in teaching Black children. I mean, I just think that that's a really necessary and important part of our. Yeah. We well, yeah, a couple of years ago, uh, two years ago, Kevin was it two years ago, three years. Yeah, Terry, you, you, you. I'm not sure what you're going to say. Sister Cora. <laughs> Sister Cora was probably three yes. years ago. Yes. Two years ago. Two years ago. We, we gave an honorary doctor to the first sister, black sister of mercy. Right. That was accepted into the Marian Mercy community. Oh. She was the first uh, woman of color to be accepted into the community. And it was in the 1950s. Wow. Prior to that, they would never accept any woman of color into their community. Um, and she, and when she was first professed, she was sent to an all white uh, community in Levittown, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And the mother superior of the mercy said, uh, I'm sending you there so they can deal with you. Oh boy. <laughs> and, uh, the pastor of the parish that she taught in the elementary school there was all on board of having this black mercy sister teach in an all white school. And she's, she, she was incredible when she came to speak here. She was just an incredible woman. Mm. But that was in the 1950s, when you think about it, the 1950s was the first time that a, a religious community accepted a person of color. May I, may I say something to that? Sure. I'm Ernestine Carter, and uh, I'm also an educator. I graduated from Hallahan in 1954, and I, I went on to college. But they wanted me to become a nun. And I thought about that, and I said, I would like to become a mercy nun. This is 1954. And they, my advisors at Hallahan quickly dropped the idea. They quickly, they said I could go to, um, the Oblates of, it was in Maryland. Yeah, ob, the Oblates of. The Oblate uh, Sisters, right. Yeah. But no, they would not submit my application for as a mercy nun. One other thing, just two weeks ago, I dropped off my uh, ballot at the library in Bryn Mawr. And as I began to wanted to drop it into the box, I was asked, do you live in this community? Oh my God. But I, and, I, and Terry and Kevin, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. It was magnificent. I learned a lot. A lot. Yeah. All right, I, I think uh, we're about to wrap it up. Uh, I wanna thank Terry and Kevin we really appreciate the thought and the preparation you put into this. And you've given us many, many things to think about. Uh, for the rest of you, I'd like you to think about what we should do during 2021 as far as a, our ongoing series, uh, topics, presenters, uh, new formats, whatever it might be. So, again, thank you all very much and good night. Good night, Jack. Night. Night. Night, all. Night, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again, Jack. Yeah, good seeing you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, Lacey. Thank you. That was wonderful. That yeah, was wow. really good. Right. Wow. All right. We'll have to... Uh, deconstruct it.